Greetings from Messiah Lutheran Church on Skidaway Island in Savannah, Georgia. Welcome to this worship service. You can follow along in the bulletin, which you can access at www.messiahsi.org. It is the sixth Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Our reader today is Pat Cooper, special music by Diane Boyd on piano. The flowers are given by Patty and Clark Field in celebration of Clark's birthday on July 10th. The eternal candle is given this month by Shirley and Phil Knack in celebration of their 57th wedding anniversary on July 27th. A few announcements. The council has opened up the recording of worship to those who would like to attend in person. So you need to RSVP in the office by Thursday and the recording session will take place at 4 p.m. on Saturday, July 18th. So come on over and join us if you would like. Also, I'm going to discuss a book uh, with those who are, interesting, who are interested, <laughs> The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James Cohn, talking about racism and, with a Christian perspective. That'll be on July 29th at 3 p.m. You should read the first couple chapters by the time we meet on Zoom on that July 29th, 3 p.m. occasion. Our gospel reading today is Jesus' parable of the sower from Matthew 13, but today I would like us to understand it as the parable of the four soils. So with that, let us now have a time of centering and reflection during the prelude. Our service continues with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting in God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Amen. We continue with the gathering song, Lead On, O King Eternal.
Let us pray the prayer of the day. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah 55. For as the rain and the snow came down from heaven, and did not return until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so that my word shall be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which I led, and succeed in the things for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come the cypress, instead of the briar shall come the myrtle. And it shall be the Lord, it shall be for the Lord a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 65. You shall visit the earth and water it abundantly. You make it very plentiful. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for so you provide for the earth. You drench the furrows and smooth the ridges. With heavy rain you soften the ground and bless its increase. You crown the year with your goodness and your path overflow with plenty. May the field of the wilderness be rich for grazing, and the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadow cover themselves with flocks, and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let the shout, let shout out and sing. Second reading is from Romans 8. Therefore, there it is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the Lord of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh, so that we may just requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things that of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, through the body, though the body is dead because of the sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give you life to your mortal bodies, although through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, 
a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, the John Deere website has a page that says, supersede your expectations. The pun, supersede, is S-E-E-D. And the line underneath says, when time's short and you have plenty of ground to cover, John Deere delivers with a complete line of everything you need and the sizes you want to seed for success. Air drills, commodity air carts, fertilizer attachments, central commodity systems, upgrade your 90 series opener with the state-of-the-art parts to improve seed to soil contact, depth consistency, germination, and uniform emergence. Plus pre precision AG technology to stretch your productivity to higher levels. Now here in this compelling website for a person who does not grow plants, I was interested in how technology would improve um, the planting of seeds. We have learned that we went from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy, and now to a digital economy, that we've gotten much more efficient at growing crops. Fewer Americans are needed to feed, for example, per 100 Americans when it was um, maybe two generations ago, you know, um, double or triple how many Americans were needed in the field of agriculture. Efficiency, speed, and technology are what's emphasized. And this is quite different than what we have with Jesus in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. We're going to be looking at parables in the month of July. Each one, each Sunday, we'll look at a different parable. The word parable means para, which means alongside, and balos, which means to throw from the original Greek. And what it means is to invite a comparison. And so we have here a comparison, a Jesus teaching about the Word of God and how the faith life looks in comparison to sower and seeds and soil. Jesus often taught in parables. The parable has been described an earthly story to illustrate divine things. 
My favorite definition of a parable is, is that the purpose of a parable is to tease the mind into active thought. Why doesn't Jesus just talk about this stuff? Why does he use a story? Well, stories stick with us. Stories have embedded knowledge and teaching, and our ears learn in a different way in the form of a story. At our men's Bible study on Wednesday mornings, we were talking about parables, and one said that in corporate culture, stories are a powerful way to improve culture. There's that story about that thing that we need to do or prioritize or avoid. So parables on the surface are simple, but when you dig in, they become kind of interesting and will tease the mind and stimulate active thought. And so on the surface of things, here we have a simple story about a sower who sowed seeds. And then later on, Jesus explains the parable. He only does that for two parables. Usually just Jesus puts it out there and we're supposed to figure the thing out. But here we see the parable of the sower and Jesus explains it. So we have this title, the parable of the sower, but it has also been called the parable of the miraculous yields. But for today's purposes, I would like us to settle on the title, the parable of the four soils. The seed, the sower, the seed being the word of God, where is it put, how does it grow, that's something to do with our faith lives. And we will look at each context, each soil, and reflect on them briefly. This parable observes first century conventions when it comes to farming. Most notably, first the seeds are planted, then the plowing happens. Well, that's not how we do it today. And while we will look at the parable more closely, we might think about, well, what is Jesus trying to tell us? The word of God going to different contexts with different reactions and depending on those contexts? This parable challenges how we might have pictured Jesus' ministry back then. Didn't Jesus love everybody? Didn't everybody just love Jesus back? Well, no. People rejected Jesus. People resisted Jesus. Some decided that Jesus was an outright threat to their sense of well-being or stability. How do we understand this? Don't you just need love and that's all? No, says Jesus, and he tells this parable. Jesus, the sower, spreads the seeds and people react in different ways. Not everything, and everything was easy, not in Jesus' day, and not today. No, the parable describes why it is that there would be resistance to Jesus' ministry and to his word. Jesus offers it to everyone, but not everyone responds in the same way. The seed is sown, but there are different contexts and different responses. And in this way, Jesus' parable is a description of a reality most of us are all too aware of. Same setting, same family, sitting in the pews together, same confirmation class, fast forward years later, the kids grow up, some attend worship and engage the faith, others do not. Why is that, we might wonder? And I think this parable gives us an explanation, or at least a partial explanation. Jesus highlights variance in how people respond at different places and different times in their lives. So we will talk about the four soils, but I want to, before getting into them, I want to note that the fact is, is that people can't be labeled or branded one type of soil. 
Life is more complex than that, and so is the faith. Our lives are a mixture of different types of soils that Jesus names today. But to hear this parable is to hear the seed again being spread, and how you receive it is, in a way, a fulfillment of this parable. But we do well to take note what are the different environments? What are the four different soils that Jesus describes? And what are the threats there are to the seed growing? Four soils. First soil, seeds that were sown on the path. Jesus says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. That was what's sown on the path. So we would understand that the seed that lands where the soil has become hardened from being repeatedly walked on simply sits on the surface waiting to become food for the birds. Jesus says, whoever hears the word of God and does not understand it. Understanding is an important quality for the people of faith and an especially important to the hearers of Matthew. Last week, our gospel reading, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learning, growing, understanding. Faith is dynamic. It waxes and wanes, and like a muscle, it can be used to grow stronger, or it can remain dormant and grow weak. Understanding, or the seek, seeking understanding, that faith pursuit is a sign of a healthy faith. Inert or dormant faith remains vulnerable to be simply snatched away or taken away. Will we understand everything all-encompassingly or instantly? Heavens, no. But the pursuit of Jesus' wisdom builds character and dimension to faith. Do not become like the rocky ground. Seeds that were thrown on the rocky ground. What was sown on the rocky ground, this is what one, one hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, yet such a person has no root. Endures for a little while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away, says Jesus. The seed that falls on rocky soil has difficulty taking root because the soil inhibits the growth of roots necessary for plants to ex access the nutrients of the soil. So in our lives, in this type of soil, do we ever feel like giving up when we deal with adversity, when trouble arises? Which response do you have when it comes to God? Flight? that is leaving, or fighting, that is remaining in relationship. Rocky ground is flight, abandonment. But faith is fighting to stay, to endure, to take root, even when the context is not welcoming. Finding a way to cling when there is that voice inside saying, just give up. Rocky ground. Troubles, persecution threaten our faith. That's the soil of the rocky ground. And then there's what is sown among the thorns. This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. The seed that falls on ground covered in thorns must compete with already well-established invasive plants and stands little chance for growth. Jesus warns us about the world, that place that is different than what Jesus wants for us. He warns against the pursuit of material wealth. 
he uses that term lure that draws a person into a place where there's no room to grow. The love of wealth, the pursuit of the cares of the world, choke out God's word and leaves little room for the seed of Christ to germinate or grow. The thorniness of life, the pursuits are what the thorny soil is. But finally, there is that soil that is good soil. As for what was sown on good soil, says Jesus, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The seed that falls on the soil that has been prepared, turned over, loosened until it's fine soil, replenished with nutrients from the decaying matter of leaves, that seed thrives in the good soil. I've been drawn to this question of good soil this week, so I took a trip out to a place where they know a lot more about plants than I do, uh, Skidaway Farms here on Skidaway Island. It's a community garden where in 2000, 10, the people of Skidaway thought, what if we had a place where we could till our own sections of soil and put up barriers because everyone fights the deer and the raccoons and the crows and we could carve out a space. Well, when my daughter was six, shortly after we moved here, someone invited us to become a part of Skidaway Farms through the children's program and farmer Jane Coleman So I met with her this week, and I asked her about good soil. And to be honest, she seemed like she was ready for the question. I wondered, the kids, they're vegetables, and their plants are so robust. They just show up on Saturday, yet they're teeming with life, and big, you know, vegetables come out of it. And I concluded, with Farmer Jane that it was the soil. And she said, yes, it is the soil. Well, where do you get this good soil, I asked her. Can you just go to Home Depot and buy yourself a sack of good soil? No, she said. And her explanation of good soil sounds like the life of faith. Good soil takes a long time to cultivate, says Farmer Jane. You must feed the soil, she says. Well, what on earth do you feed soil? You feed it compost and fertilizer. You embellish the soil, she said. Getting good soil is hard work and it takes time. You must measure something called tilth, T-I-L-T-H. Soil tilth is the physical condition of a soil. You know, it has to do with soil particles and stability and moisture and degree of aeration and how water infiltrates and drains through soil. Farmer Jane, a native of Minnesota, speaks intriguingly about soil. In a way, what you put into your soil is what comes out of your plants. And what you put into your faith life is what you will get out of your faith life. And Jesus points to one seed and says it will bear fruit and yields. One seed, in one case a hundred, in another sixty, and then another 30. Jesus' kingdom is his word multiplying and bearing fruit. A bountiful harvest is life with Jesus. We do not save ourselves. Jesus has done that for us, but how we respond to that saving grace is what we would call today soil management. 
making sure it has the right blend of air, water, and fertilizer, that which would promote growth and bear fruit. How we measure bearing fruit? Do we say it means that you're going to heaven or that you're saved or that you're forgiven? Well, those are marks of soil that Jesus' word has been planted in for sure. But I think good soil extends beyond the individual to the community. Being good soil is extending the bounty of harvest to other people. Marks of love and caring to the people closest to you, the people in need around you, and yes, the rest of the word, world. As I heard it recently, God is interested in spiritual fruit. Than more, than more, God is more interested in spiritual fruit than religious nuts. So take note of your soil. What threats are there? Is, it, is your soil receptive to Jesus' word and love and life-transforming grace, or is there resistance? Where must there be plowing, tilling, aeration? And that would be good soil. But with all this talk of good soil, we need not to lose track about the goodness of the sower. The sower is not like John Deere, so precise or strategic to put soil only in certain places. The sower does not look for situations that have high probability for success. There can be thorns and rocks and paths, and Jesus will throw that seed there, and it can grow there too. This is a risk-taking sower of seeds, throwing down seeds recklessly and relentlessly on all soil as if all places, therefore all people, have the promise of bearing fruit on the rocks, in the path, in the places where we think life could not emerge. Christ brings new life in his word which might lead us to wonder if there is any place or circumstance in which the seed of God's word cannot sprout or take root. Good soil, yes, but even better, a good sower of the seed. To God be the glory now and forever. Amen.
believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to unity with one another in the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Gracious God, your word has been sown in many ways and places. We pray for all those places where your word is planted around the world. Inspire us by the witness of fellow Christians to the faith we share. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Reigning God, we pray for our nation. We pray in this time of the pandemic that peace would rule our hearts. We pray for protection and guidance. Bless and protect those who serve, putting themselves in harm's way. Our police, firefighters, military. We pray for doctors and nurses, healthcare workers. And we pray for scientists that they would find a cure or a vaccine for the virus. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Abiding God, care for all who are ill and in need of your life-saving love. 
We pray for Wade Will Winslow, nephew of Barbara Johnson, for Jean Clemstra, brother of Mary Manor, for Hannah, daughter of Stephanie Williams, Tom Seipel, Susan Morris, Willane Liu, Catherine Tureen, Jim Hazel, Izzy Flynn, Ellen Olson, Mary Buck, Judy Nord, and Anne Green. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Renewing God, revive your church in this place. Nourish and nurture the seeds you have planted that we might grow as disciples. Replace what has been depleted. Sustain our ministries and deepen relationships with the wider community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give thanks for all who have died. Comfort us in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. We close now with the sending song, Guide Me Ever, Great Redeemer. <laughs>